Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are made for the presence of the Lord. So if worship felt great, that's just an affirmation of what you were made for. You are made for the presence of God. That's your native country. So you just got to walk around home today. So if you're new with us this morning, I, feel, I pray that this feels like home to you. Amen. That the Holy Spirit inside of you goes, I, I feel and sense the presence of the Lord here. And that's what our most fervent prayer is for you, is that you come here and you feel that, that sameness of the presence of God that our, all our hearts really long for and love. Today we're going to jump right into some scripture. We're going to talk about Ananias from scripture. And all of you are thinking Ananias and Sapphira and uh, that's not where I'm going. There's actually three Ananiases in Scripture. One is a high priest. One is the one who withheld an offering. But we're going to talk about the one who went and prayed for Saul to receive his sight. So I'm going to tell you what you already know, but just set the scene a little bit. Ananias comes on to the scene when the early church is just getting going. What happens is, is there's this Pharisee of Pharisees. His name is Saul. We know him in Christendom as Paul, and he wrote the vast majority of our New Testament, or at least that's what we think so. And, uh, and he's an incredible man, but before he was incredible for Christ, he was incredible as an adversary of the things of God. Scripture literally says he was breathing in and breathing out while breathing out murderous threats against followers of the way, which is a, an, a Bible way of talking about being a Jesus follower. And if you're breathing it, that means you're living it. If you breathe it, you're living it. I want you to just get a sense of who this guy is. He's living this persecution. And one of the most potent examples of it in Scripture is the stoning of Stephen. Stephen becomes the first martyr of the New Testament. And he is, he is killed at the hands, the approval of Saul. There's this part of this story that says, and they, they laid their cloaks at the feet of a man named Saul, meaning he, he's the authoritative figure there saying, it's okay to kill this guy. And, and it's getting so bad in Jerusalem where all of our faith has started, where Jesus was crucified and resurrected, that this faith that's growing like wildfire becomes so persecuted that it starts to spread out. It starts to head north, it starts to head south, and we get this dispersion. But if you look at that word, even that is really good because if you know God, you know that he does his best work in adversity. So this dispersion that happens, if you study the word out, it literally means to scatter or to sow like seed. So what the devil meant to cause is a cessation of this thing that would change the world and change lives and your generations down in the heritage of that kind of people. You've received Christ, you walk in the Holy Spirit's power, you're a disciple of Jesus, and we owe it to these first followers of Christ who passionately said, I'm going to lay my life down for the sake of others. What they thought would be the end of it, we're going to wipe it out from Jerusalem, we're going to scrub this little thing out before it can get going, was literally the planting of our faith that spread it globally. It was scattered seed that became the, the, the germination, the point of where all of this starts to really take off. So Saul's not happy with that. So he gets permission to take his persecution even further. He's a bad dude. Like he's mad about this. He's extremely zealous. So he goes to the priest. He says, hey, a bunch of these guys went up to Decapolis. It's a city north of there. And he goes, I want to persecute them there. I'm sorry, I think I said the wrong city. Damascus, I'm sorry. Damascus is actually one of the oldest cities in the world. A lot of people say it is the oldest city in the world. So I want to go to Damascus, and I want to persecute them there. So he gets permission, and he's on his way, and he's got three buddies or, or so, something like that. And this light in the middle of the day shines so bright that it blinds Saul. He falls to the ground, and the Lord begins to speak to him. And he says, why, why are you persecuting me? And Saul asked this question like anyone would. If something so bright and so interrupting happens in the middle of the day, he goes, who are you? Who's doing this? And I says, it's Jesus. It's the one you're persecuting. He goes, it's hard for you. It's hard for you to fight against me. 
Well, his buddies have this experience where they hear the voice, they see the, that light, but they don't really hear the audible sound that Saul hears. Like, it, it isn't intelligible. So the instructions of the Lord to him is to get up, to go into the city, and to stay there. And so his buddies get him up, and they take him to this street called Straight Street to a Judas. So just like there's many Ananiases in Scripture, there's many Judases. This is just a Judas. So whatever the name is. And when I grew up in high school, I had a, a graduating class of 80 people, and there were seven Dans. <laughs> All right. So I grew up as Fitz. That was my name, just Fitz. That's what they called me. Uh, so what? Yeah, there were nine of us. <laughs> this is a big aside, but I was towards the bottom. And we had varying degrees of character and diligence when it came to school in my family. Some were 4.0 students who got offered to go to Annapolis and uh, do the military school there. And others uh, were offered to not return the next day. <laughs> so my teachers would ask me, so which one are you like? So, yeah, I go, well, you're about to find out, aren't you? <laughs> Buckle up. So this is the seed, this vicious persecutor of the things of God, a zealot. And he does it because he's, he thinks he's doing right. He thinks he's doing the right stuff. Has this incredible encounter with God. And then enters this scene, this man named Ananias. Why do I want to talk to you about Ananias today? Because if I talk to you about Peter, he's a man who's had an experience that receives the empowering of God at Pentecost, and he becomes arguably the founder of the church. I'm Peter, this is my rock, I'll build my church. His life is so extraordinary that when he passes by people, his shadow heals them as it goes over them. And I don't know when the last time that happened to you at Walmart, but it hasn't happened for me for a while. So in some ways, he's very relatable to, in other ways, he's not. Like impetuous Peter is one of my favorite characters. He's the only one who gets out of the boat. Or I could talk to you about Moses, but Moses accomplished so many incredible things that sometimes it's hard to relate. Ananias shows up in Scripture for about six verses. And it's, he's just referred to as a certain disciple. A certain disciple named Ananias, and I'll read this to you now. This is where we'll get into it. Acts 9.10, Now there was a believer, a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias, and he said, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, he replied. Ananias has a vision. Now, Moses had this encounter, you could call it a vision, at the burning bush. Peter has a vision that changes the way the message of Jesus goes out to the nations, what's available there. There's vision after vision after vision after vision in Scripture. But this very ordinary guy has this vision. He has this vision that changes the course of Saul's life to where he becomes Paul, and that changes the course of our life. And I thought, if an ordinary guy can be extraordinary, then that's worth talking about today. Yeah. I was one of seven Dan's, right? One of seven Dan's. And sometimes in life you just feel pretty ordinary. But God does extraordinary things with ordinary. Amen. What does vision do to us? Well, first of all, when we talk about vision in Scripture, it's not like um, you can probably envision what you're going to eat for lunch today. And I, I want to be careful there. I don't want you mad at me already, so don't salivate too much, but you picture it, okay? Vision in Scripture is not that. You can envision yourself eating it and enjoying it. You could envision the people that you're around. You can envision maybe what you're doing tomorrow when you go to work or engage your day. You can, that's not what vision is. You could have a vision of where you want to be in five years. Vision casting. I want to be at this spot in my life. I want to have accomplished these things. I want to have these boxes checked. That is a kind of vision, but that's not the vision we're talking about in Scripture. Vision in Scripture is entirely unselfish. Vision in Scripture exists to serve God's purposes, not our purposes. So then how do we relate to Ananias? Well, he's ordinary. How do we relate to vision? Well, one of the most common things about people who are in Pullman, 
especially followers of Jesus, is they made a choice to stay in Pullman, in Moscow. There's, there's something about a call of God that has held a lot of us in this room here. It wasn't just the relationships, although they're great. It wasn't just the friends. It wasn't just that you met your spouse. But you guys decided, yeah, I did too. And she's really pretty. I swear she gets more beautiful every day. It wasn't just that. Think about it. The Lord called you here. We say that, but really, he's given you a vision of what life is supposed to look like here. Maybe in another case, none of us would be followers of Jesus if it weren't for a vision he gave us. He gave us a vision of what a life would be like if we stopped living for ourselves and started living for him. He gave us a vision of what life could be like if we started saying yes to the things that he called us to and started saying no to the silly, selfish cycles that get us back again and again and again and again and again to the same desperate, hungry, thirsty spots we get over and over and over again. A vision compels us to action. Vision simultaneously provides direction and peace, urgency and security. A vision simultaneously provides direction and peace, urgency and security. How can it do that? Because you must obey it. And because without it, we're just lost following our own best ideas. So today we're going to talk about yes, but go. We're going to talk about Ananias and this whole process, but really you could apply it to anyone who has a vision in Scripture, and you can apply it to your own life. What does yes, but go means? Yes is the beginning of hearing the voice of the Lord. Today we all felt his presence. We enjoyed him. David, the worship team, my gosh, can you guys put your hands together for them? They're not just talented musicians. They're men and women of God of character and of substance who brought the presence of the Lord into this room together with us today, and that's incredible. Yes is that thing that we all want. We all want to hear the Lord speak to us. We all crave that sense of touch and of his presence in our lives. It's like oxygen to us, but is usually the next thing that happens. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. I've got plans for you. Hold up wait a second, and go is what God does with our objections or our reasoning, and we'll get into that. So yes, yes, Lord, is what he said in Acts 9 through 10. Yes to receiving vision. God, we want to hear you. God, I need you now. I'm standing on the God of, which one spoke to you? But it can't stop there. We can't just say yes to the things that we really want from God. God, I just want the comforting sense of your presence. God, I, I just want your touch. God, I just want a miracle in my life. God, I just want you to transform this situation because God will give us vision that will compel us to action. So Ananias does the right thing. He says yes. But now we're going to engage this a little bit. How do you get the supernatural power of God in your life? It's by starting to walk in obedient action towards what he's called you to. It's so, so, so important. So the Lord says to Ananias, go over to Straight Street, go to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Tarsus is another northern region city. He is praying to me right now, and I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. So, go over to Straight Street. Yes, Lord. Yeah. Thanks for speaking to me, God. Absolutely. I'll go to Straight Street. Go to Judas's house. Sure. I'm sure I can find it. I mean, I'm a resourceful person. Just ask around. Maybe he knew him already. I have no idea the context. Ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Hold up. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Saul from Tarsus, because remember there's a lot of similar names in the Bible, Saul from Tarsus, that's that bad dude who's killing Christians. Hang on just a second. I was all on board for hearing the voice of the Lord until then. Have you been there? 
I bet you have. I bet you're there right now. Because Amir's message last week asked us to take a bold step. By the way, I felt like the Holy Spirit gave me permission to meddle a little bit. You're not just supposed to take one bold step. That's too easy. It's too easy. The bar's too low for you. You're supposed to take a lot of bold steps. So if the Lord's lining them up for you, then just get out your bowling ball and knock them down. Go get them. But that's just go be bold. Hold up, God. Hold up. The Saul of Tarsus? That Saul? That Saul? Maybe you could relate to it this way. The Lord says to you, oh, Dan, I love you. Yes, Lord, you do. You love me. I'm so glad you love me. Dan, I'm with you. Mm. Amen, Lord. God is with me. Yes, Lord. Dan, I have plans for you. I know you do, God. Scripture even says it. I know it. Yes, Lord. I'm going to use you, Dan. Yes, Lord. My life's got purpose and meaning. That's why I signed up for this. I wanted to be used by you, God. Go to work today, Dan. Yes, Lord. I can do that. I can be obedient in that. Do a great job. Yeah, do all things heartily as unto the Lord. Yeah, I can do that. I can do that. At lunch today with your coworker, tell them, I love them. I'm with them. I have plans for them, and I want to use them. Hold up just a sec. <laughs> that was all good for me, God. <laughs> that was all good for me. But do you really know this person? Like, have you noticed that when we talk, they're not on board for that? They're not really like the have a Jesus conversation with them at lunch kind of person. So hold up just a second. We all have yes friends. They're people we rely on. You know what I mean by a yes friend? They're like, they're like a 90%. If you call them and you're in need, I got it. my best yes friend on the planet, and I'm sorry for the rest of you who are, is Jordan Bingham. He answers his phone before it rings once in my ear. I pick it up, dial his number, put it in my ear. He goes, hey, Dan. I'm like, it didn't even ring, Jordan. How do you do that? Do you just sit around with your phone like this? It's amazing. He's the fastest. I like, anyway, I don't know how he does it. When his phone goes from here to here, you don't even see the motion. <laughs> it's incredible. He's an amazing guy. You have yes friends. Yes to what? Well, Yes to Costco runs, yes to working out, yes to getting coffee, yes to last minute, yes to road trips, yes to problem solving, yes to verbal processing. I'm a no to verbal processing, <laughs> but uh, with the grace of God, I could be a yes. <laughs> My wife's laughing because she's a verbal processor. <laughs> yes to barbecue. Can I get an amen out there? <laughs> I thought there'd be a few in there. Yes to late night. Who are my late nights in the room? Oh, come on, late nighters. Give me a little more than that. You guys are like, actually, I'm still tired. I was up till 3 a.m. All right, yes to early morning. Who are my, yeah. How many already have five cups of coffee in you? Let's go. That's right. I start the day with two and I'm just warming up. I don't have enough coffee until I shake my way out the door. Hallelujah. Yes, friends. Why do we keep these people at the front of our minds? I'll tell you, it's not complicated because no is awful to hear. Right? Man, could you help me? No. Oh, that sucked. Okay, fine. <laughs> hey, would you, are you up for a road trip? No, I can't do that. Oh, okay. All right. No, you don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear no. You want to hear yes. So you keep them on speed dial. Like, they're there. I want you to just think for just for a second. Who are, who are your yes people? You go, yep, 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 yep. Here's what I want to ask you. Are you on the front of God's mind? How fast do you answer his calls? That's what we're going to dive into a little bit today. We are designed to be one of God's go-tos. Somebody he can count on when we're all in need, when he's in need of something. <laughs> like he needs anything, but he'll use us. We all want vision. We all want vision. But God's looking for obedience. Vision without obedience. And obedience is the really important word. Remember, we're not talking about vision casting. We're not talking about a five-year plan, a 10-year plan. We're not talking about your goal setting. We're talking about a vision that comes from God. So it isn't vision without action. It's vision without obedience. It's just a dream. It's just a dream. 
And for Jonah, vision without obedience became a nightmare. It can become claustrophobic fast if you won't obey the Lord. He'll put you in some tight spaces because he's gracious. It's not that he's mean. It's because he's gracious. What can the Lord count on you for? But let's get into, but Ananias. This is where I think you guys might relate just a little bit because I can. But the Lord exclaimed to Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. Totally logical. Hey, God, just in case you didn't know, just in case you hadn't seen, just in case you weren't reading the papers, you know, like, just in case Stephen didn't tell you when he showed up up there, this guy's bad news. There's this thing going around, and, and maybe you, you, yeah, no. Have you guys heard that phrase, yeah, no? Yeah, no? Anybody, well, it's just off the top of your head, that I know that. Yeah, no, you, you know somebody who says that. Okay, reverse it, no, yeah. No, yeah, anybody? Okay, I've been told it's a Californian thing. So I studied it out a little bit. It's not really just from California. It begins in Australia. Yeah, no is simultaneously saying yes and no at the same time. And it's used for different purposes. Let me give you some examples. Do you eat meat? Yeah, no, I eat anything. What? <laughs> what that means is I'm low maintenance, okay? You with me yet? You following? Yeah, no. Okay, or simultaneously reverse it. No, yeah. No, yeah. Do you know people who do this reverse it without even thinking about it? They put a ridiculous statement in the correct order without even thinking about it. How does that work? Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Here's another one. To signal hesitation or imply mixed feelings. You okay? Yeah, no, I'm good. What? What does that mean? I'm not good. Okay. I guess. Yeah, no. To simultaneously accept and deflect. You had a great game. Yeah, no. None of this happens without a great team. What does that mean? I'm pretty darn good, but all this attention is a little awkward. Yeah, no. <laughs> to acknowledge and disagree. Back to do you eat meat? Do you eat meat? Yeah, no, I'm a vegetarian. Oh, hi. What? Meaning... No offense, but no, I don't eat meat. Okay, you guys tracking with me now? Yeah, no? Yeah, no? Yeah, no? Why do we tell God what he already knows? We're letting God down gently. That's what yeah, no is. That's what no, yeah is. I don't want to just tell you no, so I say no, yeah, or yeah, no. I'm just letting you down gently. Like, hey, can you help me tonight? Yeah, no, I'm busy. That's like shorthand for, I really don't want to disappoint you. So normally I'd be a yes, but tonight I can't because I already have plans. How convenient is that? I think we should all adopt it. Yeah, no. No, yeah. No, no, we won't all adopt it. Yeah, no. No, yeah. We're letting God, we're letting God down gently. Yeah, no. It's really dangerous, Lord. Yeah, no. I'm not the right person. Yeah, no. I'm not sure it's the right time. That's what the but Lord that Ananias was going through. He wasn't telling God no. He was trying to reason with the Lord about this thing that's going on. We tell God what he already knows because we're trying to let him down gently. We're on our way to saying no. We're sort of dragging our feet, right? We know we should but we don't want to leave the comfort of the situation that we're currently in. But remember what our speaker said here before, slow obedience is disobedience. It's passivity. Maybe we're analyzing the situation. Maybe we're just trying to help God make good decisions. Hey, I want you to go to Straight Street, go to Judas' house. There'll be a guy there, Saul of Tarsus. I want you to pray for him so he can receive his sight. Don't worry, I already told him he's coming. Hey, God, great. Let's think about this, though. Have you Googled it yet? I mean, have you done your research? Like, like if we're going to pray for him, Lord, how should we do it? 
We better analyze that. Okay, and then let's get our map out and make sure we know where Judas' house is at so we don't get lost along the way because we won't want to be efficient in the process, Lord. That's what we want to do. And our analyzing literally becomes a stalling tactic. Oh, God, do you know what? I'm, I'm going to need confirmation. I'm going to need, I'm just, I'm, so let me ask about 12 dozen people what they think. I'm going to gather a bunch of opinions. Now, there is wisdom in a multitude of counselors. That's so important. But then you got to do something about it. Yeah, no. I just want to make a good decision. I don't know the last time God gave a vision to somebody and went, hey, let's workshop this. All right. We'll get together. Uh, David, I'm thinking about going after Goliath. I'm just wondering, you know, is it the right time for that? David, give me your thoughts. Would you just, could you just bounce that back to me? What do you think of the timing? Now, how many people should we send after him? And what kind of method should we use for that? Just give me your thoughts. Mary, do you know what I'm thinking of doing? I'm thinking of bringing the Savior of the world to the earth. Would you give me your thoughts on that? Do you know, more specifically, I had in mind using you. What do you think? Do you know nothing would happen? Right. Nothing to get done. Maybe, yeah, no. I'm not even married. Yeah, no. My husband's not on board. Yeah, no. My family's going to disown me. What about Peter with the whole sheet letting down and opening up the gospel to the Gentiles? <laughs> yeah, no. Are you kidding me? I haven't eaten meat in my entire, I haven't eaten that in my entire life. Nothing unclean has ever come into my body. Yeah, no. But God doesn't invite our opinion when it comes to vision. He gives us a direction and expects us to follow through with it. God doesn't ask us if we think he's got good ideas. <laughs> How appropriate, I guess, huh? Here's what I'm thinking, Abraham. Here's what I'm thinking, Moses. Hey, Jonah, got an idea. Peter, just want to run this by you. Elizabeth, got this plan for your son. Paul, thinking about changing the world. When it comes to what God commands, a passive no. Please hear this with grace. Because I think it applies to us. A passive no is still sin. A reasonable no is still sin. Come on, you're called of God. You're called of the Lord. God, let me just reason this out. No, 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 no. He's the God of the impossible. Weren't we calling on the God of David? A reasonable no is still sin. A logical no is still sin. Since when did God have to do it the way that it makes sense to us? A hesitant no. Dragging my feet is still no. And here's the one that really nailed me. A nice no Still sin. Still sin. God, it just really isn't the time. No, right now is the time God's prepared you. He's preparing you now. So that when he says, go, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. He didn't, he didn't mess up his timing. The things you're going through in life right now are all making you ready for the thing he's calling you to. It's all preparation for the next thing that's coming. God, didn't you, didn't you notice? Oh, you must have been blindsided by this one. You probably weren't told that Saul was coming up here. I'm not really prepared by you, God. No, he doesn't work that way. He already prepared you for it. You've got what you need. If God's giving you vision for something, he gave you what you need to do it. That's what's happening. Here's the other thing the Lord doesn't say when we give him our, yeah, but Lord, he doesn't say, shame on you for thinking that way. You shouldn't think like that. Moses gave God like four objections. Hey, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. Da, 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 da. Well, who should I even say sent me? Oh, say that I am that I am. The I am sent. Oh, okay. Well, how, how will they even know that I have the authority to do this. He goes, well, pick up your staff. And God shows him how he'll do the miraculous. Oh, but I don't even speak good, God. I'll send Aaron. But at some point in the graciousness of God to deal with our objections, do you know what he does? 
he does this. Go! Go! I answered them all. You're out of reasons to say no. What's your next bold move? How long have you been thinking about it? Go. Go. Can you hear it? Go. Just go. I'll meet you with the miraculous along the way. But the Lord said, go. <laughs> God help us. But the Lord said, go. Amen. To an ordinary guy. To you. To me. Go. I heard you out. I understand. I know who he is. Go. Saul's my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my namesake. God combats our objections with purpose. If obeying the God who gave his life for us is not enough, he goes, it's the greatest adventure you'll ever go on. Yeah. Hudson said this as I was talking with them about this, and this is how I'll close. And he gave me permission to share it. Usually when I talk about my boy, he's nine years old, he gets embarrassed. So I just want you to know he hears the Lord. Um, he said, Saul with An without Ananias is just a blind guy who got what he deserved. You're darn right you blinded him, God. You saw what he did to Stephen. You probably should have done more, Lord, but I'm glad he'll suffer for the rest of his life. I'm so glad God did that. <laughs> Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, but I'm glad I get in on that one a little bit. Saul did deserve the judgment of God, but God had other plans. What if Ananias thought that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for blinding that guy. You answered my prayers. I knew he was coming. I've been seeking you. Thank you for blinding him. That's what vision does. Vision interrupts our whole way of thinking. Vision changes our plans into God's plans. Vision changes our sight into God's sight. Vision transcends this heart that can be so calloused and hard towards doing the things of God and moves us towards the graciousness that God operates with. Aren't you glad that God didn't leave you where you deserve to be? I sure am. I sure am. So Ananias went. So you went. And he found Saul. And he laid his hands on him and said, sorry, brother, Saul. Just can't. <sighs> Brother, not murderer, not adversary. God called you to people who just destroyed your life. No, I don't associate with them. They're toxic to me. Not if God says so. 
No, I don't go to, it's going to be really inconvenient. They're dangerous for me to be around. I think we serve the God of the impossible. One word. That's how powerful scripture is. Brother. Holy cow. So he laid his hands on him and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly. Something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then, then he started the rest of his life. Then he started to live out the call of God. Then a man so capable at destruction became so capable at constructing. He got up and was baptized, and afterward he ate some food and regained his strength. Look at how fast he goes to work. Saul so stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. We deserve the judgment of God, but the Lord had other plans. And ordinary believers are never excluded from the extraordinary ways of God.